Are you yawning right now? Yeah, dude, this is so boring. <laughs> <laughs> they know this shit. Instead of going to Wikipedia, <laughs> I'm just reading a quick synopsis. I'm gonna listen to these two jackasses. This is everything you need to know before you go see It Chapter 2. Not about It Chapter 2, because it no, would yeah, be spoilers. No, yeah, but that's spoiling. Before it comes out, September 6th. We did it. That was really bad. All of them went to the same school. They never really talked to each other because they were all kind of separated into different groups. They kind of had each other, but uh, they were considered losers. It basically started with four friends, Stanley, Bill, and Richie, and Eddie. That's you, my friend. Oh, oh! There was initiation, and he uh, he had to do this thing called the Hockstetter dance, which is where I, I had to dance in my underwear. It's like the truffle shuffle. It is like the truffle shuffle, but um, yeah, but I wasn't that. Richie hung out uh, with a bunch of these kids in, in middle school, and all of them were bullied. They had the same interests, and everyone just kind of bonded together and became best friends. Thus, created the Losers Club. Then, during that summer of 1986. I'm pretty sure it was 1989, because 27 years later is 2016. Anyway, that summer of 1989 is when the other losers were added on. Mike lived in Derry, but he lives on the outskirts of Derry. He was getting bullied by Henry Bowers, and the other guys were being bullied by him too. When he was in a moment of need, his losers stepped up and protected him. Ben joined the Losers Club uh, after he got bullied and got an H cut into his stomach by Henry Bowers, and then fell down that cliff, and the Losers Club kind of saved him and then invited him to the quarry, and all of a sudden, he was in the group. The first person she really got a chance to talk to was um, Ben. It was actually kind of the first interaction uh, that she truly had that was kind of memorable and uh, it really uh, stuck with her and led her to have an uh, inseparable uh, friendship. And it's all history from there. So his first encounter with Pennywise is in the form of Judith as he's putting away one of the books in his dad's office. I mean, that's pretty scarring on its own, I would say, but that kind of fear manifesting into a real thing is something that... Spooky. Spooky, yeah. It continues throughout his character arc in both films and that kind of trauma really affects him in the mm -hmm. future. Your hair is winter fire. January embers. My heart burns there too. Firstly, it shows Ben's talent for writing poems, but it's inspired from Beverly Marsh. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's a lovely little analogy of Ben. His heart does burn, right? Yeah. He's burning for the girl, uh, and he keeps it sort of locked away, that furnace inside. It's so genuine uh, and true that he has a trouble revealing that he was the actual writer. Right. So Bill Denver kind of takes the credit for, for a long time. This is kind of where you get the feel that he's starting to be a little bit lonely and the librarian is like, hey, you should get friends. And he's like, mm, I don't really want them. Because he didn't want them at the time. He had books mm -hmm. and that's all he needed. But then he goes in that basement to find another book. And uh, that's kind of the, the first encounter with Pennywise you see with him. Egg uh, boy. Egg boy. Which was actually one of the most scary scenes for me, I think. It was a terrifying scene. Blood kind of splurts out of the sink, covers her head to toe in it, and also the whole bathroom. And only she can see it, because that's kind of its power, so to say. It's kind of a version of her growing up. When she got her period, she couldn't tell her father about it because of fear of what he might do. Growing up scared her because she didn't want that uh, with her father around. That was kind of a real shock to her also because it was all blood, <laughs> a lot of it. That was kind of the climax of the first film for him. Nice throw. Because he grew up with his grandfather who taught him to fear people and to not trust anyone. So 
that moment of finding a group of good people that he felt he could trust, that was the building of that relationship that would scope his whole life. Come on, Cloud, dance. Do it like you did in the thing. Come on, say the staph infection line. Have you ever heard of a staph infection? Have you ever heard of a staph infection? Also what I say kind of shows that my guy's so hyper anal retentive about health. He's the extraordinaire of sanitary. San extraordinaire of sanitaire. That's what I wanted to say. Sanitation. San I wanted to say sanitaire, but it didn't sound a word, so it doesn't work. But Bill, if you don't come with me, you'll float too. 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 I think that was the beginning of his hatred towards Pennywise. That's when he suspected that Georgie might be dead, and that's why uh, that's where things kind of changed for him. And he felt the need to go find his brother or find out if he's dead or not. We're all afraid of something. All the losers felt comfortable enough to admit that they had fear. And that was the moment for Mike to open up and really expose himself, which isn't something that you've seen him do. That was the first time he was able to really open up about something that's been so traumatic and so much of a part of his story. As the losers, that was the first time they got an insight into who he was. Right. It just made that bond that they had all started like to forge, like it just made it like come together. Yeah. They started to gel. In the book, it's incredibly important because it's, you know, it's something that his mother made him do. It's feeling like if he could get that phrase out, he could, at one point, if he was like he's satisfying his parents in some way. And, you know, as much as he is not to blame for the death of Georgie, there's a feeling uh, that not only did they lose Georgie, but his parents lost their relationship. The parents lost their vitality and their happiness, and he blames himself for that. So that phrase becomes something that, if he can get that right, it's, it's almost like, it, it's a symbol of getting, trying to fix his family, which he never does. Time to take your beer, ready. When he broke his arm, it kind of like broke to him that it was this was this was like a real situation like this is like a reality and it's not just a fantasy like that's happening it's like legit and yeah. it's danger so it was kind of like the breakthrough he needed Next why are you looking at me i didn't film the scene i know maybe oh. you did more character research i don't know no i didn't i just watched what you did in the movie i said i'll just talk as fast as that kid did richie's first encounter with it he finds himself in a room full of clowns stupid clowns It's Pennywise exposing the fear that he has bottled up inside. Ugh. I thought you said you wanted to get out of this town too. Because I want to run towards something, not away. Having the losers around, she realizes there is some things that it's worth fighting for and there is something that she doesn't want to run away from. Running away from this fear and running away from something you're scared of is something that she's kind of been doing her whole life. And having them say that they're gonna run away not only means they're gonna run away from their fear, but they're also gonna run away from her. She's very desperate to kind of keep them together because that's the one thing in her life that she has. And so that moment she's kind of standing up against them in a way, begging them, saying, please don't leave. When you're running towards something, it's your decision. You are the aggressor in the situation. When you're running away from something, you're reactive rather than being active. And next time we'll be better prepared. No! No next time, Bill! You're insane! Why? We all know no one else is going to do anything. And he was nearly killed! And look at this mother He's leaking hamburger helper! Bill and Richie have a disagreement. I will say, Richie is like, 100% right. Right, of course. No one wants to do that. Who wants to yeah. fight a killer clown? Like, yeah, no one wants to do that. 100% right. 100% right. You're scared, and we all are, but take it back. Bill! Bill punches him in the face. He gets pushed over. Oh. He's trying to be the alpha. The group is frankly stunned. Stunned. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, broken apart. 
This is how we pitched the movie to, and yeah, it, they just Warner started Brothers. throwing money at us. Yeah. Warner Brothers was like, <laughs> <laughs> bags just cash. <laughs> and then Jack Warner came out from the grave, was like, huh? He's like, I like these two guys. They're funny. And just where do you think you're off to? Out with my friends. Sweetie, you can't go. You're getting over your sickness, remember? My sickness? Okay, what, what sickness, Ma? what these are? They're gazebos! They're bullsh**! They're gazebos! They're bullsh**! Is kind of me realizing my, my, my life has been a lie. Did you improv that? Oh yeah, gazebo was improv. I tell you, man, I'm like 40 years old. I would never think to do that. There's a bunch of like 10 year old kids. I didn't doing, know it was gonna was get like, in. I definitely whoo! didn't think it was gonna get in. Reflecting on what I just read, I like what it says about indifference. Well, when you're a kid, I think the universe revolves around you. That you'll always be protected and cared for. That you'll always have the same friends as when you were 12. Then, one day, something bad happens and you realize that's not true. He says some words that you wouldn't expect him to say and he kind of opens up his heart to uh, everyone who's there to speak the truth in a way. And I think that's really important to his character. Uh, these are the worst answers. Let's, <laughs> let's keep going. <laughs> that was a fun scene. Well, not for Mike, because it was very intense. You should have stayed out of Derry. Your parents didn't. Look what happened to them. I still get sad every time I pass by that pile of ashes. Sad that I couldn't have done it myself. Especially back then, Mike was kind of the strong but silent type, but that was the moment he was able to show his strength and kind of overcome his fears, becoming a more brave and confident person was pushing him in that well. Yeah, that was, that was intense. It's your fault. You punched me in the face. You made me walk through shitty water. You brought me to a crackhead house. And now, I'm gonna have to kill this clown. That one was because we didn't have like a, a last kind of like one line. We didn't have any one liners in the movie, so we kind of we had to add it. it. Ended up being, I guess, an iconic line, which is really nice. I wish that that line was ad libbed, but uh, just say it's ad libbed. Yeah, it's ad it's ad libbed. Yeah. Well, are we going to base this off the books or just our imagination? Did just do it, it on the movie. Did you do it off the movie. It's that simple. Well, ben has been creating some of the most marvelous architecture. He's at the top of his game in uh, the real estate world, and he lives in a very nice house, but he's very lonely. We find Richie, when it, chapter two picks up, he's uh, doing stand-up, um, and he... <laughs> I don't blame you, dude. He's doing stand-up comedy, uh, but he feels like all the losers, this sickness comes over them, and this dread comes over, and they have to, uh, and then he gets the call, because he gets the call from Mike. Mike has become a librarian's assistant, not actually the librarian, but he is now living in the clock tower of the library, and he's been researching everything that he could possibly find out. It's like, the same way that you're researching everything you can find out about IT and IT Chapter 2, Mike was researching everything he could find out about Pennywise. But times 10. Very different, obsessive even. Bill moved out of Derry pretty soon after uh, Pennywise was defeated, or as they thought, defeated the first time. He beat his stammer in his teens, and he became what other people thought of as a hack writer, but he also became a very successful writer, uh, writing horror stories and scary stories, and all this stuff that happened to him in his youth that he couldn't even remember because the glamour and the magic of Derry means that you forget when you leave it. He never really f knowing how to end these stories and never really able to replicate the love he felt for Beverly or find it in anyone else but constantly trying to chase it. You know? Beverly, when we see her 27 years later, is a fashion designer and she has a fashion line alongside her husband, Tom Rogan. Because she repressed the memories of her childhood and the abuse of her childhood, she continues to live a cycle of abuse. It makes it quite painful and complicated. So it's a pattern uh, we find Beverly repeating uh, in the 27 years. 
Eddie is, I'd say, pretty happily married, but dealing with some issues from his past. Uh, and he gets a, a phone call from Mike Hamlin wanting him to come home. Stanley has married his um, wife, Patricia, and they've moved down to the south. He's in, married his wife, yeah. You know, he's an accountant, and he owns a small, medium-sized firm with for a comfortable life. That's it. When Beverly is missing, your squad is being terrorized by a demon clown and you just found out that your pills are gazebos. That's hilarious. <laughs> this is just making me feel like I'm looking at Tumblr, so I'm terrified. I know, I know. Don't you love those fan pages? Don't you no, love those? No, they're horrible. You love them. No, it's terrifying. No, you love them. That is my nightmare. That is my nightmare. version of Pennywise. Pre-adolescent so. bloggers. Uh -huh. Bloggers. What is this? It looks like something written on a condom. When it expires, it makes that face. No, oh, dude. No, sorry. That's like. <laughs> Richie chose your holding back another after already making hey, three. Hey, Katrina met you. Katrina met I, Finn. Okay. Katrina loves Finn. Oh, thank hey, you, Katrina. You yeah. Mike Hanlon deserves everything. Mike huh. Hanlon is the leader of the Losers Club. Mm. Mike Hanlon stayed back for all caps the Losers Club. Mm. Stan Mike Hanlon. I cannot agree with you more. <laughs> but, <laughs> he does stay back for them. Somewhere in there, in that 27 years, he misses that that camaraderie. So when it's time for them to come back, like there's a little bit of happiness to that, like, like finally my friends are coming back. Like I, I get to bring my friends back and we get to do this thing again. He's scared, but there's something about it that, that he's like happy that that's go, that, that, you know, that reunion. Team. Yeah, that team's coming back. The band's getting back right. together. Ben Hanska, Haystack. New kid who can't catch a break, ultimate fangirl, will fight any one thing that tries to hurt his friends, writes emo poetry, and just wants to be loved. Dang, that's a good one. The only one that is maybe not true is the just wants to be loved. Because at first, he was okay with not having friends. No. I would just add to that, just wants to be loved by Beverly. That's it. The ultimate fangirl. <laughs> Definitely the ultimate fangirl. I don't know if the, the, the writer of this tweet is the ultimate fangirl or if, <laughs> if you're saying Ben is the ultimate fangirl. It's uh, half and half. Roses right. are red, you have a nice complexion. Have you ever heard of a staph infection? I hate myself. Next, yeah, next section. That's how it feels. Every time you sell a little piece of your soul right into that lens. Have you ever seen watched the VH1 behind the music? This never ends up well for any of us. One day I just woke up, man, I was fucking empty inside. I don't know what it was. I had all stuff around me. I thought I'd feel better. CC DeVille. Next slide. The real leader of the Losers Club is Mike Hanlon. Send tweet. I feel like the great thing about the Losers Club is that they don't really care about the titles of who is the leader and who exactly. is not. Anybody can be a hero at any given moment. Right. And you'll see that definitely throughout the film. Everybody has their superhero moment and it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, one thing that Bill Hader said and, so did, and, and PJ said the other day, the one thing that they didn't realize was they had a loser's club. And since they had a loser's club, a group of friends like that, mm -hmm. they were already winning. You know Ooh. what I mean? So That's they, just deep. Did, they just didn't realize that. That's a gold nugget right there. Whatever you do, don't think about the fact that since Stanley Uris was a grade below the other losers, he'd have to spend his last years of elementary, middle, and high school without any of his friends at the same school to support him. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, I didn't even think about it like that. <laughs> I do know in the first movie when he comes, uh, he comes out of a different class than the first three in the scene in the hallway, um, Andy told me that that's because he's in like a, it's, I, I guess, like a higher math class, which makes sense. It does make sense. He eventually became an accountant. He's good with numbers. Yep. Next. <laughs> what if there's no next? Go. That was... Oh, so there we go. Oh, let's count you down. Three. Two. Five. That was every... We do it together. Yep. Three, two. That's everything you need to know before watching IT Chapter 2. And one. And all of it. This might not be everything you needed to know, but this is a lot about what you need to know. You needed to know those memes that they put on there. You needed to know that before watching this. <laughs> I didn't need <laughs> Like, Ghostbusters going like, here's what's gonna happen, yeah. right? Yeah, you just watched it. I just went and watched the fucking thing like Bill Murray. Cut that out. That's it. <laughs>